Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. On today's episode, we're going to learn about the blockbuster movie 1917. Now, if you haven't seen the movie yet, I would highly recommend you do so before listening to this episode because there will be spoilers as we separate fact from fiction. And who better to help us unravel the threads of history that we see in the movie than Doran Cart, who is the senior curator at the National World War I Museum and Memorial in Kansas City, Missouri. Before we chat with Doran, though, let's set up our game, Two Truths and a Lie. If you're new to the show, welcome. Here is how this works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, soldiers in the trenches would have been wearing gas masks a lot more than we see in the movie. Number two, the Germans really did move their troops to a new front line. Number three, Blake and Schofield were real soldiers who saved the lives of 1,600 soldiers from a German trap. Got them? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode, and then by a simple process of elimination, you'll be able to find out which one is a lie. And of course, we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to get Doran Cart on the line to chat about the history behind 1917. At the very beginning of 1917, we see the date of April 6th, 1917, but they don't really give us a lot of context for the war up to that point. We know from history it started in 1914, so it had been raging for about three years by the movie's timeline, but we're kind of we're thrown directly into the action. We don't even get a location of where all this is happening, although we do find out later in the movie that it's in France. But before we get into some of the details in the movie, can you give us a little historical context of what was going on during the war up until the timeline of the movie in 1917? Sure. And kind of the real important, it was interesting they chose that date of April 6th because that's when the United States Congress declared war on Germany to come into the war. But that was not the scope of the movie at all. But of course, that was a you know, for America and for the world, that was a pretty important event that occurred on that same day. But of course, you were right, uh, fighting on the Western Front, which is where this occurs, really started in August of 1914. And by April of 1917 had been really several years of not a whole lot happening other than people dying and, uh, you know, creation of some new types of weapons, especially tanks on the British side. And there was a whole lot happening in the world besides just trenches on the Western Front. I think the real cataclysmic event of 1917, of course, the the Russian revolutions. Most people just say the Russian Revolution, but actually there were four of them in 1917. And this really affected not only the war on the Western Front, because once the Russians basically left the war, it allowed more Germans to come from the Eastern Front to the Western Front. It also signified the loss of a huge nation in support of the Allied effort. And so Russia, by April of 1917, was already in turmoil and would really not be able to contribute uh, much to the effort after that. Although they did do some uh, fighting, especially against the Austrians uh, on the Eastern Front. And this was a time when it was really in full force, a total war, because the Germans were bombing civilians in England uh, with not only the Zeppelins, but also with heavy bombers by this time. The unrestricted submarine warfare was declared again in February by the Kaiser. And this was one of the reasons that led to America's entry into the war. And so that was primarily one of the most important things of this time was this unrestricted submarine warfare and especially how it was affecting the shipping of materials and men 
and uh, food and everything to the allied countries from the United States. So from this, basically what's being shown as a fairly small microcosm of the war to the common infantrymen in 1917, there were huge events occurring all over. In 1917, the British entered Baghdad. You know, the war in the Middle East was continuing. The incredible use of artillery in 1917, really, you know, even though they used it a lot before then, it really came into its own in 1917 with the amount of artillery fire that was occurring, especially on the Western Front. But you've also got Italy. You've got, uh, you know, the fighting in Italy uh, with the Italians and the uh, Austrians. And so that's what we try to cover here at the museum is, is this was a real total war and there was going on. And, uh, you know, to, and to pick out a real specific event is interesting for, from a historical viewpoint. And, uh, you know, to talk about that um, where it seems more of a personal kind of activity as opposed to this huge global effort that's going on. Uh, with over 30 nations involved. And uh, I think really 1917, not only because of America's entry into the war, but because of Russia basically exiting the war, really changed. And this was uh, also, you had mutinies in the French army. Not that they didn't want to fight, they just didn't want to attack because their, their losses were so disastrous in an offensive in April of 1917 called the Nivelle Offensive. And they said they would fight and protect their country, but they didn't want to go over the top. Then you have Germany. In, in Germany, there's mut- there are mutinies in the German Navy. But because of the Battle of Jutland, previously the German main fleet had not left the port. And so the German sailors were being basically treated poorly and they weren't allowed to go out of the port. They weren't allowed to leave their barracks basically. And so there were started to be mutinies there. So, uh, and then you had bread mutinies in uh, among the civilians uh, in Germany. You had bread lines in Russia. You had bread lines in England. This was, uh, there was a lot, a lot going on in this time period. Sorry, I kind of rattled on there. But. No, it, it really gives, I, I think it gives a great idea that even though it is a microcosm, like you mentioned, they're really focusing on just this one little part of the story, but there was just so much more that was going on at that time. Correct. You really, uh, that's what we really try to show, you know, here at the museum and in our scholarship and in the research that we make available. And, um, you know, we try to show that the museum is an international source of information about the World War and what's going on. My kind of standard phrase when people ask me about, say, a particular day or a particular battle or whatever, I'll say, well, I know a little bit about a lot of things <laughs> <laughs> not a lot about one thing. And so I like, I'm glad that people do center on particular efforts and particular battles and things like that. Being a material culturalist of the war, I have to really deal with everybody who was in the war and what the material culture, how it was being developed, what it meant, how it was used. And so when people ask me to talk about a specific thing, I really have to do my homework and you know really find out what was going on. Well, speaking of getting into a little more of the specifics, the main characters in the movie are two Lance Corporals from the 8th Battalion. They're named Tom Blake and William Schofield, uh, played by Dean Charles Chapman and George McKay, respectively. Were they based on real people? Not that I know of. I think from what I've read from the director, uh, they were kind of amalgams of men that he had heard about as a child growing up. They might be based on actual people, but... You know, you'd really have to go deep into the British rosters, really, to find it. Not somebody that really stands out as a main character that we would know about from history. No, no. Because usually when you get that kind of notice, they've been awarded like the Victoria Cross or, you know, the Military Medal and things like that. 
And I don't think he really meant for them to be standouts kind of thing. It was just these were two ordinary men thrown into an extraordinary circumstance, which I think really goes to the whole statement about World War I. These extraordinary men and women who were thrown into incredible circumstances way beyond their control, and how did they react to this? How, how did they survive or not? And how did they really think about what was going on around them? Yeah, it's like you're saying, there's a lot going on and it, all the way down to these little individual storylines. Well, I don't, I don't think they're little, but I think they're more personal. Yeah, that's a good way to phrase that, yeah. Now, according to the movie, the Germans abandon their lines and they move back a few miles. Uh, we see this as... I think it was Benedict Cumberbatch's character, Colonel McKenzie. He believes that they're on the run. They're planning this massive offensive to finish the Germans off once and for all is the implication that we get. Of course, little do they know that the Germans have retreated on purpose and they laid a trap for McKenzie's men. In the movie, we see this from General Aaron Moore. He's played by Colin Firth. And he says that they found out that it was a trap thanks to some aerial photographs of the Germans' new line. But they can't communicate by phone because... Lines have been cut by the Germans as a parting gift or as they're retreating, right? So that's why that's what sets up this. Okay, a message needs to be delivered from General Aaron Moore's position to Colonel McKenzie before he launches the attack the next day. In the balance, we have, I think we've seen this with a lot of the marketing materials, uh, the lives of two battalions or about 1,600 men uh, in the hands of the success of this mission from just two men. Of course, one of them, bring it back to a personal level, one of them is one of the messenger, Tom Blake's, his brother. So it's a, a personal miss it, mission for them as well. Is there any historical truth to that? Well, it's not necessarily saying is it true, it's how is it interpreted. So like the Germans never acknowledged that they were in a retreat. They were in a consolidation of their troops along what they called the Siegfried Line, and the Allies called it the Hindenburg Line. And basically they were just going into a better position where they'd already created a lot of concrete emplacements, fields of fire for machine guns, uh, open uh, areas for artillery fire. And so uh, in all the German accounts that I've read about this, they never said they were retreating, you know, so there again, it's an interpretation and that they were moving into a better position because they really kind of felt that they were too far extended. Now, whether this could be received, perceived as a, a trap in this retreat, very well could have been uh, perceived as that. Uh, and especially because Germans, when they, when they had real positions, like are shown in the movie, they were want to, to abandon them because they built good positions and they were defending Germany. At, their back was the fatherland. Then the Allies looked at this consolidation and they said, oh, they're retreating. And so, and they're retreating to the Hindenburg line. And so, and this probably was true on their part. They, that's probably exactly what they thought was occurring. And they did have aerial reconnaissance, of course, had been in use from the very earliest part of the, part of the war in 1914. That's what airplanes really started out being. Uh, were for reconnaissance and for photography of where the primarily where the enemy artillery positions were at, because that's what was important. And so, in all likelihood, an aerial photography over this area would show them that these positions had been abandoned, uh, and troop movement would be kind of hard to see unless it was in truck trains and that kind of stuff, and you know, larger groups, just a body of men moving would not be as easy to photograph because the plane goes over pretty quick and they're snapping the pictures and relaying this information back. But there again, in looking at a, and we, we watched the movie here in a preview a couple of weeks ago, it is a dramatization uh, of, you know, of things that were occurring and had occurred uh, during the war, primarily seen from the British point of view. And so that was my viewpoint that it wasn't a documentary. It was a dramatization of similar events that occurred on the Western Front during the war. 
one thing I'm curious about is just how, uh, I guess I'll, I'll back up a little bit, because one of the things that struck me about the storyline was this massive contrast. And I alluded to it earlier that, you know, the lives of 1600 men relying on just two. And one, there's one line of dialogue from the movie that stood out to me to explain this. It's when Blake and Schofield were given the mission by General Aaron Moore. They ask, is it is it just us? Is just the two of us? And General Aramore replies with a quote from uh, Rudyard Kipling. I had to look this up afterwards where that was uh, down to Gehenna or up to the throne. He travels the fastest who travels alone. So just the idea of relying so many lives on so few in order to save time. Do we know of any stories where something like that might have happened? There again, it's very possible. Generally, when communications like this had to occur, there were soldiers specifically dedicated as runners that would deliver messages. So they did and, you know, could travel in pairs in case something happened to one of them, the message to get through. The thing about with World War I communication is that primarily it was done by telephone. And the telephone wires tended to be cut by artillery fire. As you can see in the movie, when they're going through the trench, you see the telephone wires and the telegraph wires along the sides of the trenches. Well, you know, you explode a section of that trench and that blows the wires, which is why they had lots of options. Believe it or not, they were still using messenger pigeons. And you could deliver messages from one coop to another. They used flashing lights or heliographs. The British were very good at that. They used signal flags. They used flare guns. There is a reference in the movie to a flare gun. Primarily, those were used at night because you could see them better. Again, the airplanes themselves were a tool of communication. In our exhibition here at the museum about the air war, we have one of the canisters that a message would be placed in and it would be dropped from an airplane and it had kind of a ribbon on it that would help identif- help the pilot identify if it was dropping where it was supposed to, to drop. And generally, wherever the higher command was, they were close enough to the airfields that they could send messages that way. And so those you could consider that an individual basically delivering a message. So there were a lot of different ways of communicating. And if all of them failed, then you had your runners. And they were, they were lightly equipped. You know, they could read maps. They knew where the locations were at and things like that. And they were generally of the non-commissioned officers like the Lance Corporals, you know, or above because they had more status when they were received where they were going to. And so all those things are feasible within the context of the movie. I think as far as the dramatic aspects of the movie, I thought it was you know, very good. And uh, I like it because now it will create interest in World War I and in 1917. And when that happens, then, then our international museum uh, does come to the forefront again. And we've just gone through the five years of the centennial of World War I which created a great interest in the history of the war. We, we work with students all over the world with our education programs, our online, as well as our teacher training. Uh, we do online exhibitions. And so um, we're kind of in the same business as these, these two fellows, these two messengers are. We're trying to deliver the message uh, about what occurred in World War I. And so a movie like this that basically – I was not aware of really until, you know, we started getting the advance information about it really helps. It really helps in the, in our providing information about the history of the war. You mentioned the trenches and I wanted to ask about this. I'll I'll set up how the movie explains it because trenches during world war one are something that they're almost a, they're a a character of, of their own and a major part of it. So the first thing comes from, there's a line of dialogue is in the beginning and there were Blake and Schofield were walking down a trench and one of the older soldiers says something like, hey, you're going down an up trench, which as soon as I heard that, I was like, wait, there's like one way traffic. I didn't I guess I never realized that trenches were really 
it was like going the wrong way down a one-way street. And then the other part of it was I saw a big contrast with the way that they portrayed the British and German trenches. The British trenches look like you might expect. They're wet, muddy, held together by wood, little protection from a dirt berm above. And then the German trenches look very different. And you mentioned the the wires, even the wires along the wall in the German trenches look much more organized than in the British trenches. They have cement walls. And I just got the sense that the Germans built these trenches with more care, had more time to build them and built them with more care than the British side. Can you give a little more insight into what the trenches were like, how they were depicted in the movie and how accurate that depiction may have been? Sure. That's probably two things that people, they don't know a whole lot about World War I before they come to the museum, and when they leave, they know a lot more. But when they come, they know about trench warfare, and they know that the Germans early in the war wore spiked helmets. Those are two th- things that are ubiquitous about the war. And because we use that spiked helmet as kind of in propaganda, that was the spike helmet, was all, even though the Germans were all wearing steel helmets by the time the United States entered in 1917. The trenches really started on the Western Front in October of 1914. And quickly, the German engineering was better. The British and the French, they didn't want to build trenches because they thought it showed they were on the defense and they always wanted to be on the offense. But by 1917, you had to have a whole network of trenches. And like you say, the up trench and and all that. Well, there were layers of trenches from the front line or where they would attack from. Then there'd be a second line, a communications trench, basically. And then there'd be trenches for bringing up supplies, food, that kind of thing. Then there'd be latrine trenches. We said to have those. And then you'd have, in some places where you had enough room, you'd have even rest trenches. And so, even though they weren't, they tended to be built more in haste than the German trenches were, they still were engineered. In other words, they knew how to build them, where to place them. The other thing about where they were fighting in northern France and in Belgium, was we're really below sea level. You dig down, you go down six feet, you're under the water basically most of the time. This is when this term duckboard came into use, and these are kind of, they look like closely boarded ladders that are laid in the bottom of trenches so that you can walk upon them and not disappear in the mud because people did. They did disappear in mud. So the saying was that it was so wet the ducks even needed something to walk on, so they had the duck boards. And, you know, that's, that's a legend, you know, that you, you can't really find that written down anyplace. And then conversely, and, of course, going back to this point, the British and the French always planned on attacking. They didn't plan on staying in trenches. But by 1917... This frontal attack of everybody jumping out of a trench and running against German machine guns and artillery was really more of a suicide mission than anything else. I know my British friends will disagree with me on this, but the British always were waiting for a cavalry attack. They were always, they always had the horses there and because your majority of your British command were originally cavalry officers. And so they had the horses in readiness. When a breakout occurred, they'd run the horses out there and, and win the day, even though by this time, you know, tanks, poison gas, incredible amounts of artillery shells. Artillery was the main killer on the battlefield in World War I. 60% of the battlefield deaths that occurred in World War I were from artillery. 60% of all the deaths came from disease. While fighting on the battles, of course, inflicted incredibly horrible casualties, disease really, you put all these people together in one place with horrible sanitation, with 
uh, with the rats that they showed very effectively <laughs> in the movie and bad food. And after a while, just living in mud and, and wet all the time affects people. And so they realized that you had to rotate people out of the lines. They couldn't be in the lines for weeks on end because then they don't become an effective fighting force anymore. The Germans, however, really had to bring all their support and their supplies from Germany. Whereas, like the French, they were in France. They could, you know, call upon, train their people, move them up into the trenches whenever they wanted to. They actually even started by 1917 after some of the mutinies. The French let people go home on conjugal visits, basically. <laughs> and, of course, they were right there. And the British, it was harder, but I think that was kind of alluded to that it was harder to go home to England and come back into what you had left than to just stay there and not worry about going home and you know seeing what life was like at home. And, of course, then when the Americans got in, they took over a lot of the trench lines, of the French especially. They had no place to go. I mean, they, they had to go on ships to get to France. So they had to give them the rest periods as well. And, and the Germans did the same thing. They cycled people off. They put rest battalions. They put them on rest and then bring other battalions up and things like that. Especially after the Russians were basically out of it, they had more troops to bring uh, to the Western Front. Trenches were not all the same. They were not ubiquitous. They were known throughout the world because at this time you had reporting, you had movies, you had photography that was printed almost immediately. And so people in lots of places could see what was really happening in the war that they hadn't been able to before. Now, even a lot of it was censored. You still could get the idea of what it, what it looked like and what it was like in these situations. We have some replicas or of trenches here, of different scenes in trenches that visitors could look into and, and see what it was like. That's really just a snapshot. And of course, they're very clean. <laughs> no rats? <laughs> we do have a dead rat in one of them. Oh, <laughs> nice. And we always tell the, the, the school children when they're looking in there, see if they can spot the rat. And he's a big one. <laughs> But you can see then the deterioration of these trenches as you go from 1914 to 1917 through 1917. And then people talk about the Western Front being from the English Channel all the way to the Swiss Alps. That's true. That's where the Western Front was. But trenches were not continuous throughout that. They were in particular areas, either in defensive positions or offensive positions, uh, and so there were gaps in them, but it, primarily because of geography. Um, you didn't have to protect where there were these straight up mountains in the Vosges Mountains down in the south, but you still had defensive positions there. You couldn't you couldn't attack straight up one of the Vosges Mountains. I've been there, and, and just walking walking up there is is not an easy task. But when you get to the top, there are defensive positions there. So you could see what was going on in the valleys below. But like where we're talking about what's featured in the movie, that's really trench warfare. That's really, you know, what it was looking like. And there again, you can't really show everything that was occurring. I hate to say this, but a movie about war calling it entertainment is kind of, uh, you know, hard to say. But I think and when you say it's you're watching a drama or you're, it's like a stage presentation or something like that, then you are being taken to another place. And I guess that's what entertainment, you know, really is. And and I think that this movie, for people who really know little about World War I, will be taken to different places that they've not even thought about before. I thought one scene that was really effective was when um, a fellow, when he was by himself, and I can't remember his name, he goes in that town that's being shelled and the flares are going off and everything. And to me, that, that really looked like what they would have seen. That was you know, this kind of hell on earth presentation. 
And I know it was very dramatic, but it also I thought was very effective. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because that is a, a big part of the movie. Uh, Schofield was the one who was going there. And, Schofield, yeah. And the city we in the movie we find out is Ecusimont. Was that something that actually, was the city actually bombed out in 1917? Well, they all were. There wasn't any place left to, on the Western Front that wasn't rubble. Uh, now, some places like uh, Albert, the uh, church survived there and the steeple because that's what they use for sighting artillery. And so that was a high point. It was the highest point you could see from miles away. You, you try not to destroy the churches. But any place that could be a defensive position was basically seen as fair game. When you go to France now, you can see the places that survived that were rebuilt after the war, like Verdun and uh, Albert and places, Amiens, places like that. But there are some places where there was just nothing left. They're called ghost villages. They have signs out there and said, this is where the village of whatever used to be. That happened throughout in Belgium, in northern France, on the eastern front, in Russia. In some places, the troops actually pulled them down and used them for in building their trench systems. And civilians were gone. There were no civilians in these areas. And they basically had gotten out in 1914. Sometimes they got trapped there if they'd gone back for something or whatever. But there was very little left other than rubble. And when you go through these beautiful French villages and stuff today that historically they were there, but they've all been rebuilt. They built them to look like the village that was there. But, but yeah, pretty much everything like that was gone. Wow. That leads into another part that I was curious about, too, because we see in the movie that the Germans, I'm going to call it retreating because that's what, that's what they did in the movie. But as as they were leaving, they essentially laid waste to the land behind them. They chopped down trees to block the roads. They destroyed bridges. Uh, they left the trip wire that nearly collapsed the tunnels on the two messengers, one of the big points in the movie. Uh, and they're even killing the cows so the British soldiers couldn't eat them later. That was something that was mentioned in the movie as well. Did the Germans really lay this path of destruction as they were retreating? If they were able to, if they were not under constant air observation, if they were not under attack from the air or from artillery, they would block roads and uh, destroy bridges. I don't know about cutting down individual trees, but a, a road was a major tool, a major weapon in the war, because that's how you moved people. I would think that they did. Of course, uh, the Belgians and the French did that in their retreats in 1914 and knocked down walls and things like that to block the advance. Germans, it occurred uh, as far as it occurring in that particular area. I'm, you know, I'm not familiar, you know, with that. Uh, but yeah, sure. And bridges especially were always something that you could either use or you had to destroy it. One of the two. And you couldn't just leave a bridge stand because that's how you transported. And then when you got in, you collapsed trenches, you know, on themselves. Objects were wired with booby traps that were seen as kind of souvenir kind of things, particular weapons, food, things like that. A lot of times they didn't have time to do it. Basically, if you're getting out, you're getting out. I know I, I read one description that I've always liked to uh, quote from one of a German, a German soldier, when they went into a French trench, you know, he was telling everything that they found in there, including the foie gras. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, you didn't, if you didn't have time to take your foie gras with you, you were not, <laughs> you were not able to do a whole lot of damage. But then I was reading an intelligence report from uh, the 89th Division, the American 89th Division in the Battle of San Miguel in September of 1918. They advanced so quickly that the Germans really had no chance to take anything with them or to do anything. They found a place. The Germans had a beautiful gardens. They had a beer garden, you know, which for the Americans, that was pretty great because they were a dry army. That was great. And so they talk about it. They found cigars. They found pictures and all this kind of stuff. So around this time, in this consolidation of the Siegfried line, you had more time because it was planned. It was a planned movement of troops. 
It was not a it was not a helter skelter retreat, so they would have time to arrange booby traps and things like that. Anything that appealed to the common soldier. Kind of one thing that I've I uh, remember is in the Operation Michael, which was a German offensive in 1918 in the spring, trying to break through the British lines before the Americans got there in full force. And by this time, equipment was bad, shoes were bad, everything. You know, they didn't have a whole lot of stuff. They were well-trained troops. They had good weapons and everything like that. These were stormtroopers primarily. But they got stopped, not necessarily by the defense of the British, but after when British soldiers were dead and killed in front of them in this advance, they stopped to get boots. You know, picked up boots, put their boots on, things like that. So in a real retreat, you're not going to have time to take a whole lot with you. In a measured movement, you have more time to create that thing, which is what, you know, really what was shown in the movie, that, you know, they had destroyed some of their defenses. They had left some artillery pieces that they couldn't move. They knew that in advance because if you had to get out, and take stuff with you always took your guns with you. You always took your artillery because it took a lot to produce those. They were your main weapon. And if they were busted, then you'd leave. Them. If you couldn't move them, then you disabled them. Take the breach blocks out, you know, whatever like that. I guess there are two types of retreats. There's there's one where you have to just get out, and there's another which is a planned movement a planned movement away from one place to another. And the second one seems to be more of what we saw in the movie. Yes, that's right. And then when they moved to the Siegfried line, it was even more, a more powerful position because they had the height, whatever heights there were, there were no real heights (laughs) to speak of there, but they, in the fields of fire, that was what was really important was so that you could have crossfire of your machine guns. And if any troops coming along, it's called an enfilade. You would always sight those in clear fields of fire. And in some places, that's why they cut down trees. What trees were left, there were not a whole lot of trees left on the Western Front. Now, you know, all that is feasible. It just depends on what they were planning and, and if they had a plan in the first place. I want to switch to the offensive side, because according to the movie, by the time Schofield finds the second Devons in the wood, it's morning. And so he asks why they haven't gone over yet. And they identify themselves as D Company. They're the second wave. They don't all go in at once. And this gives us a little insight into what it must have been like for an offensive from the trenches. Because we see Schofield running through the trenches trying to find Colonel McKenzie to deliver his message. And soldiers are queued up to go over. We can hear officers. It's not a main part of the movie, but we can hear the officers barking orders. Okay, A Company, you're going on the first mark, B Company, then you prepare for attack, follow your platoon commander and stay spread out. And you hear the whistles blowing. Okay, this is, you know, on this is when we're going to charge across the battlefield. We never really see the enemy necessarily in the movie, but we see all of this start to the attack getting organized. How well do you think the movie did depicting the way that the attacks were organized from the trenches like that? Well, I think they really showed the human nature of it very well, you know, on basically in the fear and the uncertainty, the things that were going to happen. Again, this is a dramatized event. You know, when you're really doing that, you create the drama and the pathos that's occurring. But by 1917, you really have to realize these these fields are full of shell holes. They're full of dead animals. They're full of dead humans. They're full of poison gas, all types of gas. The skies are basically black with shell fragments. Machine guns are everywhere. German snipers are everywhere. And so to really get a feeling of the drama, then that's, I think they did a good job of creating, you know, that. As far as, you know, what the Germans were doing, they were either waiting or there would have been just incredible fire going on. And there's, you know, there's fire going on, but everybody had a gas mask. You know, poison gas was everywhere. It was in shell holes. It was in your trenches. It was on your clothing. You had mustard gas, which was really an oil, but it was a burner. 
you know, it burned your skin. It burned your, you know, your inside your nose, uh, your mouth, any place there was water on a human body, mustard was there. Phagene and chlorine were respiratory gases. They were everywhere. But if you do a movie with everybody wearing their gas masks, it's hard to tell, you know, how they're acting and, and things like that. And so that's why I say, you know, in dramatization, you really have to show it differently than you do in, in a documentary or something like that. So sometimes, you know, I'm not the right person to go to a movie. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as far as it representing history so that people will realize that this is going on, that these kinds of activities are going on. 1917 was full. Just take this action and multiply it hundreds of times. I think that's really important. And I think the storytelling is important there. The idea of hearing these stories as a young man from the director. The oral histories, I think, are just really important as well. And so in, in showing this, I think that's what people, I hope that's what people will take away from it, that these guys are being thrown into situations. They don't want to be there. They want to be back in England or they want to be, you know, in Paris or, you know, wherever. They want to be in Munich. They don't want to be there. But you have to have a reason. There has to be a reason. And one of the main reasons that they do show in this with the two fellows who are the you know, the messengers, was the camaraderie. You supported your own fellows. You supported your own troop. You were there for your buddy. You were there to help them, to help them survive. You couldn't really think about yourself. You had to really think about, okay, if I'm going and what I'm doing will help other guys survive, then it's worth it. And that, to me, really is what true heroism is when a person goes out of their own self, goes beyond concern for their life to help other people. And to me, that's really truly what a hero is. We use the word very loosely nowadays, and I think it applies in a lot of instances. But to me, it always means that you, you have to go outside of yourself. You have to go beyond what will occur to you? And so in this movie, you see that with, with these fellows. And you know, one of them unfortunately dies in the quest and another gets through. And to me, I think that's really an important part of the story because they don't want to do this. They're scared. They're hot. They're dirty. They're hurt. He, you know, tears his hand on barbed wire, you know, but they realize if they do what they're, they've been asked to do, and they were really asked, they weren't really commanded to do this, then that makes their quest more important, I think. Because, you know, they didn't, they didn't have to go. You didn't really see them ordered up the chain like everybody else would have been. And so they take it seriously, one, because he's brother, the other, because this is his comrade. He's going with his comrade. He's not going to abandon him. Then he doesn't even abandon the fellow who's killed in making connection then with the brother. The quest to him then is complete. It's a good story, and you can see it. You can see in a lot of a lot of uh, movies that where you have this kind of task or I like to call it a quest. They had that in this movie. And if you say, okay, well, this is based on somebody or this is based on stories or whatever, that's great, you know, because you're still being affected by what human beings can do in extraordinary circumstances. I'll feed this back and make sure that I'm, I'm understanding. It sounds like overall, even though the messengers weren't necessarily based on individual real people, it's not necessarily a this storyline is not necessarily true. They pulled pieces that could have been true. There are things that could have happened in this overall setting that is real, of course, you know, during the war. And they turned it into 
what sounds like one of the more important parts of camaraderie, like just telling this human story of people, ordinary people thrown into extraordinary circumstances and trying to survive together. Does that sound like an overall essence of the movie compared to history? I think that's exactly right. And, you know, like uh, when they're setting really the scene, when you're in the British trenches and, you know, you see uh, how the guys are in there and how they're, where they're eating and, you know, things like that, then you're setting the scene for that. It'd be like a play where you have real good scenery that you've created for that. That's not the important part, but the important part is the story that you're trying to tell. And this, to me, is a, is a story of camaraderie and of people really going beyond themselves. As far as it being directly from history, you know, original documents or something like that, it really is not that important. Because that's what we do here at the museum. We do the documents, the original documents, the, you know, the statements. We show the uniforms and of men and women who served, um, you know, in the war and how children were affected. Children as refugees, children under bomb attacks, children picking up a gathering peach pits uh, in, a, in the United States, which were then made into charcoal, which were put into the, the gas mask filters because they knew that they made the best filtration system. There's thousands and thousands of stories. And this is one good story that they were able to tell. And he based it on his own life, his own the director, Sam Mendes, on his life. He kind of did what we'd all like to do. I think tell a good story and show it and make it dramatic and make it appealing. And again, I can't really call it entertainment, but, you know, to do that, to to tell a good story that people can take that away with. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that it was based on the director's own life. And I have to ask this because I'm sure you'll be asked this a lot. I already have been. So go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) At the very end, we do see the name Alfred Mendez from the first battalion as the grandfather of the director. How much do we know about Alfred's service during World War I? I have to admit, I don't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about him until I started seeing the previews and reading the advance materials. But the British have excellent records about the servicemen. And, you know, if he says that, I'm sure somebody's already looked it up in England at the, at the war records office and, uh, you know, determined that's, that that's true. If he'd have mentioned, if it had been about Americans, if he had mentioned some Americans' name, we'd have done the same thing. Even though we're international here, we don't have the volume of records that each country can maintain. And a lot of them, and for people who want to do this and for looking, you can get a lot of this stuff online. You can look at the Canadian war records. You can look at the British war office records. You can look at, in the United States, records from different states. In that aspect, I think it's very important. And that, that I hope he really well, it did exist, you know, so so that people can do that and they can look him up and see what he did. I know that we've had a lot of contact with people over the years. Just to give you an example, Mick Fleetwood, a Fleetwood Mac, his grandfather was killed in World War One. He mentions that and told us about him. And so, you know, we looked him up. And yeah, he was there. I mean, uh, this fellow, and I hate to say this, but sometimes the records are better if somebody died. They're always better for officers because they were considered a different kind of class. I've just been talking to so many folks about this movie that I haven't had a chance to even try to look him up. Again, I'm just real pleased that this is occurring at this time because, again, it draws attention. I hope I hope we do. I hope they do more of these. I hope that they cover other stories. You know, I've seen a lot of movies about World War I, and all of my, the ones that I like do tell that kind of story. They have that kind of connection throughout. Well, thank you so much for coming on to chat about 1917. Before I let you go, can you share a little bit of information about the National World War I Museum and Memorial and where someone can listen to learn more and plan their own visit? Sure. 
The museum and memorial have existed since 1920. Uh, the collection started in 1920, so we're, we're studying our 100th anniversary this year of the collection. And we have an excellent website. Uh, they can go there. It's, it's real simple, theworldwar.org. We don't mess about. It's the World War. And uh, they can see a lot of things. We have an online collections database of things that we have scanned that are in our collection. They can see the different events that are going on here see our online exhibitions. If they can't actually come here to see exhibitions, you can go there and see the online exhibitions. We have a lot of YouTubes because we record all the lectures and people who come here and give programs, so they're on there. They actually recorded me the other day for National Hat Day that's going to be on the 15th. I'm talking about helmets on that day. So, And we have excellent Facebook and Twitter accounts, so you can go to our website and you can, you can see all the things, Instagram, all that from there. Our social media folks are, are excellent about getting the word out. I'm kind of the dinosaur. I, I will do it if they tell me how to, like today, <laughs> and coming and talking to you. But, you know, my thing is with the, with the objects, and that's what we try to teach with here. So we do a lot of exhibitions, you know, on site here traveling exhibitions we bring in from other places as long as with our own. We like to be seen as the information source internationally for every nation because that's the museum's been collecting internationally since 1920. So uh, I'd say the best place to start is with our website. And if you forget what it is from hearing this podcast, just uh, Google World War I Museum and you'll get us because we're right at the top of the list. Well, I appreciate your time so much. Oh, well, I I enjoyed talking to you. And if you have any more questions, just let me know. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. I'd like to thank Doran Cart for his time, as well as the National World War I Museum and Memorial for their efforts in keeping these stories alive. If you want to learn more about the true history and even more stories from World War I, go visit the museum if you can. If you can't, at least head to their website to learn about some of their online educational materials that Doran talked about at the end there. You can find their website at theworldwar.org. And of course, if you're driving or unable to head there right now, I'll make sure to add a link to their website in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay. Now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, soldiers in the trenches would have been wearing gas masks a lot more than we see in the movie. Number two, the Germans really did move their troops to a new front line. Number three, Blake and Schofield were real soldiers who saved the lives of 1,600 soldiers from a German trap. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number two. That is true. Even though the Germans never admitted to it being a retreat, they did consolidate their troops to a new front line, similar to what we see in the movie. That brings us to number three. That is the lie. Blake and Schofield might have been based on the stories that director Sam Mendes heard about from his grandfather as he was growing up, But, as Doran explained, they're not people that we know from the historical record. Instead, they're supposed to show something that did happen during World War I. Ordinary people cast into extraordinary situations. That means that number one is also true. As Doran explained, because of chemical warfare by the time 1917 rolled around, most soldiers in trenches would have been equipped with gas masks. But, of course, that makes it hard to see the actors' faces and doesn't make for a good visual for the movie. That just about wraps up our time together today. Before we go, the last thing I'd like to do on each episode is share how much time and effort went into creating this episode. I know that's not something most podcasts do, and that's exactly why I'm sharing this information. If there's one thing that is surprising to most people who are new to podcasting or who have never created a podcast before, they just listen to them, it's just how much time goes into creating them. So 
I figure maybe if you find out more about how much time and money goes into creating podcasts like mine, then maybe you'll start to appreciate all the podcasts you listen to for free just a little bit more. With that said, today's episode took a total of 27 hours to create and cost $41.40 in out-of-pocket expenses. And as I always do, I want to make it clear that time and cost is only my time for this one episode. So that does not include the countless hours of my guest time researching the subject matter that we talked about, nor does it include the ongoing costs. It does not include those. For example, the monthly podcast and website hosting costs based on a true story podcast.com has its own costs that I'm not associating with this episode. It also does not account for any of the time outside of writing, researching, and producing this one episode. For example, the time it takes to maintain based on a true story podcast.com and things like that. None of that is included. So 27 hours to create $41.40 for this one single episode. Now, if you enjoyed today's episode, I hope you'll consider helping support the next episode over at based on a true story podcast.com slash support. And as a little bonus, if you do, you will get access to hours of exclusive content on the producer's feed. We're up to almost 40 minisodes that talk about how completely fictional movies depict history and even more exclusive content. It's all just a way of saying thank you for helping me keep the lights on here at Base on a True Story just a little bit longer. Now, if you're not able to support the show monetarily, no problem at all. I'm happy that you've given me some of your precious time over the last hour or so, and I hope you've enjoyed this time together as much as I have. In the meantime, if you'd like to add to the story, hop on to the Base on a True Story Facebook group, or you can reach out to me directly on Twitter where I'm at Dan Lefebvre. That's D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. And if social media isn't your thing, you can always shoot me a good old-fashioned email at dan at base on a true story podcast.com. Until next time, thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. <laughs>